Good day, good evening, good morning to everyone out there. Today we have another theme as every four weeks when I have my webinar, I try to have a new theme. The theme we have today is coffee is a drug. The widest spread drug in the world. Now for some of you or all of you, that may be a surprising statement I'm making there, right? Not that I like surprises, but I like facts and truth. And I believe deeply that coffee is a drug. Otherwise, I wouldn't say that. And in that webinar, I'm trying to substantiate it and explain it and prove it from my point of view. Why is it a drug? Um, and we, a lot of people shared, unfortunately, I don't know how many of my listeners are coffee drinker. For me as a coffee drinker who drinks at least one cup a day, one cup a day. Now I must say about my own life that you better understand where I'm coming from in case you don't know in this lifetime. And I repeat in this lifetime, I never took coffee, never drank coffee. I never smoked. I never smoked heavy stuff. I never took drugs. I never drank alcohol. So all these things which the average person does, consumes, I never did. And when I gave over the last 10 years my seminars covering many, many different subjects, Basically, everything I covered, I talked about. I'm not saying teaching. I don't try to be a teacher. I'm just saying I contribute what I found out and offer it to you. And you make a decision what I'm saying makes sense or not. Okay. So all those subjects I was talking about, basically, I went through this subject, this topic myself in my life from A to Z. I suffered, I did that, I did that. Um, or at least I had somebody right next to me who went through different phases of life and where I could watch what's going on. And I always loved the smell of fresh grounded coffee. I deeply do. I love it, but I never drank coffee. So two years ago, I, um, said to myself, well, you always talk about coffee as a drug, but you never drank coffee. And I made a decision to drink coffee, to make, to be myself, my own guinea pig for my statement. And later towards the end of the uh, webinar, I will tell you this story I went through, which is kind of interesting, I think. I hope so. All right. Now let's see where we're heading with this. And um, coffee is our topic. Yes, sure. However, before I can start to talk about coffee, I must first cover an entire different subject, which some of you may be familiar with, and some of you may think, what the hell is it to do with coffee? Quite a lot. The topic of my presentation, the first part, is called chronic stress. And I have to explain to you what chronic stress is. And chronic stress and coffee are intertwined. So hang in there. Let me present to you what I say about chronic stress. And then thereafter, we make the connection to coffee. I need to clarify this and allow me to introduce it to you. I hope you'll be able to follow. You may agree or not agree. At least you get my concept. And when you get my concept, you may understand where I'm coming from. Everybody talks every day about stress. I mean, listen, how many people in yourself you say, oh, I'm stressed today. Uh, I'm stressed with my kids, my wife, uh, my job stresses me, my boss stresses me. Can I keep my job? What about this war on terror? Can I pay my bills? Do I look well dressed for this event? I'm running late because of the traffic. I had not enough sleep. You come up with 
hundreds of reasons which you connect with stress, which stress you. Even kids in school have stress. Uh, they're bullied in school, having bad scores, not wearing the right clothing, the right brands, being accepted in the group, not having the newest smartphone. I remember that my daughters were very pissed with me when I kept them with the oldest phones, possibly, and all their friends had these newer versions of phones, and I held it back. At this time, I was starting to work on the cell phone problem. But the kids have as well stress, and the stress level is endless. I mean, we are on the airport, and the plane is 20 minutes late, and I had it happen the other day. People freak out, and uh, they get under stress. Okay. I watch people when they missed a phone call, and I couldn't stand the idea to miss a phone call, and immediately called back and said, did you try to call me? Did you try to call me? The idea that they missed a phone call put them already under stress. I had a daughter, I have a friend of my daughter visiting us, and all the two days she was in our house, she walked around with one cell phone in each hand. And uh, I know my daughter knew what I was thinking. I didn't say anything. But, uh, and I said, look, when we have dinner, we eat and we don't answer the phone. Um, you will find, when you really look at it, what I found, I went and I said, okay, that was years ago. 30 years ago, I came across this topic of chronic stress. Actually, it was 40 years ago when I think about it. 40 years ago, I came across the concept of chronic stress. And to put this up front on the table, chronic stress is for me the only reason you can become sick. The only reason you can become sick. Chronic stress can be mental chronic stress or physical chronic stress. We'll talk about this later. But chronic stress, I came across this concept. And what I did was I took a small uh, booklet, a notebook, and I, for one week, every day, as soon as I had a stressy thought, I was too late to get to an appointment, or the traffic was heavy and I was freaking out, um, or uh, I missed something to do, which I should have done. Every time I was stressed, I made a tick. And at the end of the week, I watched how many ticks there were. And it was shocking. It was absolutely shocking because it proved to me that myself, me, didn't have a moment, a moment of stress, but I had at a day during the day, five, 10 moments of stress during the week, 60, 80 minutes times stress. And I confronted myself over this situation. Now, medically, we have to understand what happens with stress, right? As soon as we get under stress, the adrenaline glands become very active, very active. And adrenaline glands are two kind of small triangle shaped glands sitting on top on both of our kidneys. These are the adrenaline glands. They produce adrenaline. Now, very clear, the human body needs adrenaline, what we would call a normal volume of adrenaline. We have to have a permanent adrenaline level in our body, very modest, very controlled, very normal, very natural, very healthy. Now, in this context, what happens is that we have, so to speak, a mechanic in our body. When we get under stress, a whole lot happens. A whole lot happens in our body when we get under stress. Whether it refers to the blood pressure, uh, for example, blood pressure and the heart rate. When we got under stress, the blood pressure 
rises. The heart rate rises. The liver converts more, more glucose to glucose than before. Our digestive system um, is depressed. So a lot of things happen once we get under stress, which ideally we don't want to see. Why is that the case? Why is that the case that automatically the adrenaline glands produce this huge amount of adrenaline? Why? Well, there is a story behind it, and there is more than a story behind it. There's the entire mankind story behind it. The entire mankind story, because nature, God, whoever created this mechanic that once you're under stress, the adrenaline pushes. And that was an historic, original, old-fashioned, million years ago, ago, a creation. A creation by a creator. Because the creator says, look, if you come across a, a saber-toothed tiger, let's say 30,000 years ago, when they were around, you had the fear of death. Absolutely. That's normal. And this fear of death created in you a situation where you had only two options. You had to fight or you had to run as fast as you possibly can to get out of the danger zone. You had only these two options. And when the saber-toothed tiger some 10,000 years, 50,000, 20,000 years ago, vanished from this planet, there were other dangerous animals, like, let's say, a regular tiger. And again, every time the human being was confronted with a situation with, at this time, typically animals, which were danger to their lives, they had only two chances. I got to fight it, or I got to run. Only these two chances. Now, in this moment, when you have to fight or to run, you need a hell of a lot of energy, of power, of strength. So this amount of adrenaline pushed your body over the top, over its normal limits. It's enormous. It's a magic trick, you could call it. In face of fear, it gives you the extra, the extra, the extra power to do that. We call it the fight or flight response. You had to fight or you had to run away to flight. And it does all kinds of things to your body. Now, besides giving you a more intense body performance. These body performances were concentrated on power to run or to fight. And that makes it so different. That situation is unique. Now, what else was happening? If you killed the tiger, you survived, good. If you ran faster than the tiger and you escaped, you hide yourself, good. So the life-threatening situation was over. And when the life-threatening situation was over, the adrenaline level would come down pretty soon, pretty quick, pretty fast, and your body would be back to normal. And that's what's important. This stress was not chronic all the time. It was in a moment, a moment of your life. And maybe that moment repeated after a week, after a month, maybe after a year. But it wasn't five times a day or ten times a day. And not for two weeks, day out, day in. And not for 
your life there out there. Um, and that situation was short-term danger. And this is important for you to remember when we talk about later caffeine. A life-threatening situation which was short-term, the key word short-term. And this emergency would go away. However, in this life-threatening situation, not only adrenaline is pushed into your body and functions, but at the same time, something else happens. The body says, hmm, we're fighting, right? Do you feel hungry? No? But you were hungry before the tiger came. Now you don't feel hungry? Okay. You feel thirsty, right? You were thirsty before the tiger came. But now you don't feel thirsty? You felt tired, right? You, you're not tired? Um, what about sex with your spouse? At the moment now you're fighting with the tiger, you have no interest in sex with your spouse? No. Because the body says, look, all these functions in the body which are not needed to fight or to run, to survive, we don't need. And either the body completely cut them off or reduced them to a level of hardly existence. Now imagine that happened as soon as adrenaline was pushed out to this level of death fear. And these situations were not chronic. They happened once in the blue moon. But this was the consequence. All right. So if we agree on this, um, and if you can follow me there, you start to understand um, what happened to your body. And in most cases, or all cases, what happened to your body, that these functions were not working properly, you didn't realize that. And still today, you don't realize it. What just happens is, eventually you become sick. Good. If you watched yourself from the bird's eyes view, you would see a lot of examples where you say, why the hell is that person, Norbert, so stressed? About what? There's no reason to be stressed. You make it up in your mind. It's so important to you, right? I personally have stopped some 30 years ago to watch TV and read newspaper, basically. And a lot of what's in the news, in the media, puts us as well under stress. The media is based on the fact that there is danger out there. If you make an analysis, which I did years ago, about what the media reports about, I made a checklist when I watched news, and I was a news junkie at this time, till I woke up and said, hey, come on. Uh, this is not serious, right? So I made a list. What catastrophic news were we exposed to every day? And I made even in categories, I did politics and, and war and crime and accidents and so on, personal loss and damages. And you'll be surprised. But the major income for media, please keep that in mind, are the dangerous news, not the happy news, the dangerous news. And we have to make a decision in life where we're going with our life. Being stressed, let others allow to stress us, or being relaxed. That's a mental condition you decide. You may not know, but you decided that. And the moment you decided to accept to watch news, you are exposed to get stressed. And when you, like with me, 20, 30 years out of this cycle, and then you pass by somewhere and you sit somewhere and there's news coming, I believe very often there's candid camera. 
Why are people so stupid to listen to this crap and being interested in that? And when I changed my life 40 years ago, about 30 years ago, about the news, my brother came up to me and says, oh, you read the book from Neil Postman. I said, no, what book? He said, amusing ourselves to death. And of course, once he mentioned that, I got me the book and I read it. And it's on my website as a recommended book for you to read, and I recommend you to read it. It's pretty old, still still standard, and still valuable. Neil Postman, Amusing Ourselves to Death. That's what it is. So, most of us are under stress, but not the short-term stress, which goes away after five minutes and is done for a week, there's a pause. No, we're under chronic stress. One stress, shake hands with the next one. Exposed to bad news and threatening news. And in a work process where the work situation puts us under stress. I don't know if um, Picasso as a painter ever was under stress. He did his job. And when he was 65, he didn't go on retirement and says, oh, it's 65 now, I put down my paintbrush. The majority of people, unfortunately, are threatened to work. And this work already they chose puts them under stress. And they're looking for Friday afternoon, 5 o'clock. They're looking forward to become 65 to go on retirement. Now, one thing must happen that you're looking for five o'clock Friday and retirement. And that's very simple. You must be very unhappy with your work. The only positive thing for me Friday, five o'clock is that no many, not many people call me anymore and I can get to do things which I have to do. And the other day said, my, my wife said about retirement. I said, what do you mean retirement? I live on the beach. You think I'm sitting on the beach every day now? I don't go to the beach. I need challenge, and it's something which interests me. What I'm doing is a big satisfaction. What I'm trying to contribute to the world makes me happy and keeps me busy, and there's no end in sight. So the chronic stress starts already with a job you picked which doesn't make you happy. <laughs> makes sense, doesn't it? Now, stress can arise from four different sources, from four different basic sources from the mental side, environmental stress, for example, 5G and uh, toxic water and uh, bad air and microplastic in the air, will create environmental stress to your body, no question. Mental stress, of course. Physical stress, yes. A lot of people just physically, when they work, when they have to accomplish things, uh, get under stress because they have a, a, a limit uh, where they feel like they cannot exceed or the age doesn't allow them to do what they like to do. And then we have physiological stress. So these are the four sources you can create your stress inside of you. But um, the biggest part of stress is, of course, the stress which other people put onto you. Other people put you under stress, and now here's the kicker, they didn't really put you under stress. You accept that what they ask you for or what your challenge should do is for you stressy. And you accept that they bring their stress into your home, into the conversation, into your life. And that was makes it all different. Stress is something you accept. And in most cases, I would say, we don't even realize it. We live in the illusion of danger. All the above has nothing to do with ourselves, mostly with what we are surrounded with and what we accept as our life. And you have to accept that sometimes in life, you may play a game in business or in the private world, where you not win. If you have two soccer teams 
meeting on a Sunday afternoon, typically one goes home and lost the game. Before you start the soccer game, you know there's a chance we will lose today, right? And you have to accept that without this destroying your life, your self-esteem, and without getting stressed because of it, it's still a game. The list of stress factors, both for young and adults, is endless. And uh, we don't have the time always to list them down, but watch yourself. And the most important thing is the question of your mindset. What is your mindset and what are you truly doing? An anger, an unforgiving, a bitterness, by the way, puts the body into a stressful situation and your body becomes more acidic. Once you're in a very stressful situation, your body becomes more acidic. You have to learn to be loving and forgiving. You have to learn to relax. Unfortunately, these things are not taught in school. We teach um, all kinds of stuff in school, which during your life you never need. And the basics of life are unfortunately not taught in school. That's just the way it is. Um, if you could follow me so far, stress increases drastically your adrenaline level in your body. And this has consequences like crazy, which people do not realize. A lot of illnesses I would address to the point that the body's functions are sabotaged most of the times, many times, over a long time, because of stress. Which brings me to my next point, that stress destroys a healthy cell. Which again, a lot of people don't know and doctors don't tell you. About doctors we talk a bit later. Now, what happens if you come into an oxidative stress situation? On the left side, you see the normal cell healthy and functioning well. In the middle, the free radicals damage all components of the cell. And on the right side, you see the cell after it's being destroyed through oxidative stress. On this plane here, I've showed you on the left, the same thing again. On the left side is an apple on the top which is fresh, green, and healthy. In the middle, you see how the apple starts to deteriorate due to the free radicals attacking the cells. And on the right side, the apple is gone and, you know, just dump it. It's destroyed by the situation. And this is what happens with our cells. I came across a very interesting fellow in Germany. Germany has loads of interesting fellows. I'm just one of them. Hmm. Yes. And this man is called Lothar Hirneiser. Not a name you can easily remember pronounce in English. Lothar Hirneiser. He created a cancer clinic in Germany, the 3E Center for Alternative Cancer Therapy. You have a website here in German and in English. And I can tell you this man has impressed me a lot. Um, his statements, his knowledge is very appreciative. And his devotion to handle cancer. What he found out, Everybody, as we said, has a normal level of adrenaline. He discovered that his cancer patients have basically no adrenaline production at all. Gone. So the normal level of adrenaline we need in our body isn't there anymore. So why is that? 
most likely the cancer, the over a long time, the chronic situation with cancer and the body fighting it has pushed the body under so much stress that the adrenaline gland were completely overproduced, overproducing adrenaline in such a long time period and such a volume and intensity level that now these adrenaline glands, they're completely worn out. They're gone, they're shot like an engine in a car which died. And the adrenaline glands don't deliver anymore the regular normal volume of adrenaline your body needs. So the cancer was not only a problem in itself, but in consequence, it made the body situation worse. Good. Now, cancer, nowadays every third person dies of cancer. Why is that? To my definition, the number one reason is electromagnetic radiation, 4G, 5G. I talked in other shows about it. And then comes bad water. And then comes stress. Stress is the headline chronic stress. Because the 4G, 5G puts your body under chronic stress. Bad water puts your body under chronic stress. So chronic stress is, to my definition, the headline only reason, at least main reason, for somebody to become to have cancer, to develop cancer. And again, stress can be mental or physical. I know a lot of people develop cancer because of a mental stress situation. There's no question. Good. Um, if you agree with me so far, or at least you understood so far where I'm coming from, then we can finally enter the theme of coughing. Keep in mind now, we've covered stress, you understand stress, and I explained that stress and coffee are intertwined. And you see as we go along how that works. So, then let's start very methodically the history of coffee. According to the books, Coffee's history starts in Ethiopia. According to the stories, a farmer in Ethiopia realized that when his goats ate berries from a certain bush, which looks a bit like this, these goats became very lively. We would say like today, under drugs, hopping, jumping around to a level where the farmer realized something is going on here. And what we call nowadays coffee beans, in fact, are not beans, they are berries. But the word beans has been so established, but biologically, they are berries. The concept of coffee started so in Ethiopia and went from Ethiopia, exported to the peninsula, which we call nowadays Yemen. Coffee became a standard for rich people. Uh, it was a kind of an exclusive arrangement, a trendy drink for the elite class, not for the average peasant, no. They couldn't afford coffee at this time, which was first very expensive, and only later on became the drink for the average person. They realized as well at this time that there's a lot of money to be made. The trade of coffee started at this point. Initially, interesting enough, in what we call now Europe, the coffee was forbidden for the Christians as it was the drink of the Muslims because originally it was what they call a Muslim drink. 
And in those countries, you had the first coffee houses. And these coffee houses were places where people would meet to have a coffee, as the word says. Um, very quickly, coffee was exported or more like smuggled the plants, the seeds uh, throughout the world, the Brazil, Africa, India, Caribbean islands, Indo Indochina, wherever, or into China, wherever the climate would complement to grow coffee. This is where they exported the coffee to. This is why we have those coffee places around the world in a certain, certain zone of climate. What happened then is that the culture of coffee houses developed. The first well-known coffee house in the Western world and Europe was in Turkey. Imagine in 1554, in 1554, the first coffee house. Then many other countries came along. In Germany, we had the first coffee house in 1673 in the city of Bremen, that's in the north, next to the North Sea in Germany. The coffee house used to be a typical place where people would meet uh, writers first at this time, writers, artists, politicians, philosophers, scholars, they would meet there to talk and to meet and greet. And the original coffee houses were very elegant. Uh, and sometimes in old movies or in newer movies, they, they, they <laughs> put up replicas of coffee houses. Um, and they're very elegant, not to compare with our today coffee shops. Our coffee shops are more primitive. They were very elegant. The coffee story wouldn't be complete without building the bridge to the average peasant. As the German king of Prussia, Frederick the Great, he recognized the value of coffee. So from 1780, wow, long time ago, 1780, until his death, it was compulsory that only the German government were the only institution allowed to roast coffee, nobody else. Um, and then slowly the coffee came in for the poorer people. And here we have an interesting situation that they realized that at times when people were very poor at these periods, a lot of poor people, that it was a great product as food, food replacement. And they, what they did at this time, especially in the morning, they had the morning coffee and at this time, you couldn't buy bread every morning fresh from the bakery. You may have even made your own bread. And I remember these times when I was young that my grandfather, when they made bread, they made bread for weeks in advance. There was no claim we want every day fresh bread. When they made bread, the bread was done like three, four weeks in advance. So after a week or two, the bread came very hard. And uh, the black out, the outside of the bread was very crusty, very blackish, so that keep the inside a bit more moist and longer. However, when my grandfather cut the bread, he took his coffee and he dunked the bread into the coffee so the bread would become softer and then he would eat it. That was a typical situation, I can tell you, like I grew up with. Coffee was a bit of a substitute food and they recognized as well it was stimulant. So people who had to work hard, the peasants, had a stimulation. I call it today, looking backwards, a pusher. A very pusher. And from around 1850, coffee was finally a popular drink. Then in the 21st century, things changed. The coffee houses faded to a big part away. And uh, we have then nowadays uh, the cheaper, easier places, the Starbucks and whatever they call around the world where they deliver coffee.
Coffee had a real, real interesting history with many different ideas. Um, you all know what uh, instant coffee is, right? Um, instant coffee was invented 1901. And from 1938, the famous Nestle company marketed the product. They saw the potential. And the very fun part is that in 1901, the man who developed, who invented instant coffee was Japanese. In the land of tea drinker, he invented instant coffee. In the year 1905, again in the city of Bremen in Germany, Mr. Roselius invented the process of removing caffeine from the coffee and called it Coffee Hark, which when I grew up was around and I believe it's still around today. And a very nice, charming lady in 1908 in the city of Dresden, a housewife, she invented filter to filter coffee, which we still use today, the technology. And imagine in 1961, the German city of Bremen still had 120 coffee roasters in town. 120 in a relative small city to American standards. Why does Bremen come up all the time in the coffee history? Very simple. Of course, Bremen was next to the ocean, had a big harbor, and coffee was coming in there. Now, to end the uh, story of coffee, um, even if you don't speak German, most of you, there's an interesting thing which happened that I remembered when I put this program to together. I play it for you, though it's German. C-A-F-F-E-E -E, Trink nicht so viel Kaffee Nicht für Kinder ist der Türkentraum Sprich die Nerven, mach dich blass und blass Sei doch kein Muselmann, der das nicht lassen kann You may not know, of course, uh, what the words mean. Uh, he was spelling C-A-F-F-E-E -E, and he says, don't drink so much coffee. The Turkish drink is not for children. It weakens your nerves, makes you pale and sick. Don't be a Muslim who cannot let it go. Now, when I was a child, we would sing this song in kindergarten and in school. One of the most meaningful things I've ever learned in school, better than trigonometry. But we didn't listen to it. Because they said in the words and in the song, it weakens your nerves, it makes you pale and sick. They already talk about addiction. Don't be a Muslim who can't let it go. And we didn't listen to it. And coffee came along. Then in the recent years, the final step is that they invented those capsules with the coffee for these coffee machines, um, which should be actually classified as a hazardous waste. These coffee capsule, metal capsules, are um, a major environmental threat. The next part in my coffee story is coffee and the coffee ceremony. Because nowadays, it's not about just drinking a coffee anymore. A cup of coffee, it's what it was started with, but there's more to it. There's more than just drinking a coffee. We build an entire story, an entire marketing campaign, uh, fantastic. A fantastic professional marketing strategy around coffee, okay? Um, espresso, cappuccino, cafe latte, americano, Irish coffee, cafe mocha, latte macchiato, ristretto, whatever you want. They built all these different markets and they really pushed coffee 
to be like a giant story and very successful, then of course you can increase that coffee experience. You can increase it easily by beefing it up to more. You add chocolate, you add cake, you add biscuits, and maybe a cigarette. And bring in some art. Make it fun, make it entertaining, uh, make it interesting, talk about it. And if you really look around, coffee, the market of coffee, is gigantic. At times, coffee is considered a personal connection from person to person. In previous times, the slightly older generation, they would invite people at home for a coffee party, for a coffee meeting. Coffee serves as a platform for many, many occasions. But nowadays, we all know it's a very young stylish as well. Not only old people drink coffee, it became very fashionable for young people. You drink coffee in the morning when you get up, come to the company, the first thing, the secretary has already brewed the coffee, you go to the coffee station and get your coffee on your way to work. Hmm, that's the way it works. Um, coffee is a part of our standard life for most people. Which should bring us then to the next topic, the process of making coffee. There's a process involved which most people don't know and they don't understand the work involved. And let me tell you this up front. Money, the big money with coffee, do not make the poor farmers. Absolutely not. They pick the coffee, the picking itself, and then many people have no idea what is involved in picking coffee. It's hard handwork. The poor coffee farmers don't make the big money. The big money is made by the roasters and by the marketing companies, but not by the farmers. And when I hear about stories today where they talk about um, fair trade, I don't know. It's again a big marketing campaign. It really doesn't happen. I don't want to get into this politics, but I can tell you, it really doesn't happen. It's a nice marketing thing, but that's what it is. So once the beans are picked, they are dried, and then comes the next part of handwork. Again, a lot of handwork, not easy. After picking, drying, they're sorting it out, a giant amount of work, which the average consumer has no idea that it's happening. After the picking and drying and cleaning and sorting it out comes the roasting part. Now the roasting, I can tell you, is the part where it's most decided about the final quality of the coffee. There are different roasting techniques, but they're all, as we say, cooked with the same water. If some coffee companies try to make themselves very special, that they have some old roasting technology, whatever, it's all bull. Because uh, there is no miracles, there is no, no, no secrets. They're doing all the same. And the roasting, however, yes, it is the biggest uh, part of quality. And there are three basic different types of roasting. The light roasting, the medium roast, and the dark roast. And the dark roast is the one which has most of uh, the caffeine and usually higher level of acidic content, which we will talk about in a minute. Then there's a newer modern technology 
which is controlled, hot air, state of the art. Um, this process allows for a better temperature, lower temperature, and a better control. But at the end of the day, it's another roasting technology. That's all there is. Okay, now we come to the final step of coffee, which is very simple and obvious, uh, the brewing part. Here, you want to give some final touch for the taste. And you have in coffee a lot of chemical compositions. This includes the amount of caffeine and acidity, which we'll talk about in a moment. By removing caffeine from the coffee, coffee becomes less stimulating. Um, lower level of caffeine. However, the diehard coffee drinker doesn't like it. Why? It doesn't function enough as a drug for them. Because they want that drug feeling. Okay? And uh, which brings us to the next theme, which is coffee and addiction. 